beauty, Miss Lynn Whitfield. Yeah. Like the this show started this conversation between me and Oprah about 
and how she got shut down for her questions in the church, and how I had left the church myself. Two different churches, but same experience. And Grace's entry into the family is that conversation, right? And so I'm just trying to keep on having an honest conversation with the show. As ungainly and strange as that might seem moment to moment, that, that makes it feel real. I want to say... And one of the things that I really love about the show is that, in, that constantly surprises me about it as well is that you do get those big, flashy moments that just make you run to the water cooler and talk about it. You know, you got you to dish it out the next day. But what I find the most interesting is the internal struggles, the very nuanced, small um, internal struggles that each character goes through. And I, I just find our writers do a beautiful job of bringing out those little things. Um, <laughs> yes, I have a church background. I grew up in the church. Um, I used to want to be a preacher. Uh, so, um, this this uh, this whole experience is very close to my heart. But you know, when I read it the first time, uh, and I think Craig asked me something about what I thought, I I, I immediately, and certainly at this point in my life, I knew I was going to be the dad. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but I immediately uh, 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 identified with the bishop because I have a, I'm a father of three children, and uh, the. The dynamics with each child and being different and being specific and particular, and how you have to deal with them, and how you have um, uh, feelings of affinity that get broken, and there's there's hope and disappointment. That's very real to me, right? So this shows like half dynasty, half that, right? And so. I think the part of what makes the show seem real is that it doesn't have this like vicious drive towards soap opera plotting. You never know when it's going to stop and someone's going to tell some story that doesn't matter to anybody but God. You know, it has a it has a naturalness to it. Trees don't grow there; they grow everywhere. They just head towards the light, you know, and the light is everywhere. I think that's how reality is, that's how the becoming parts of our souls work. And so I think the show has a natural messiness, which makes it seem true. That's my hope anyway. <laughs> this season, now that Grace has decided to stick around, whether it's for the legacy of her daughter, or if she finds loyalty to her family, or anything like that, she. But the, the Greenleaf legacy is in the church, and she finds herself back there. And her journey to figuring out what, what, what does she believe? Does she believe this anymore? And I, I find it very honest and real and true that we have all had that moment, you know, with our, our higher power or whatever, you know, we're struggling with, it, with, um, with our spirituality and the wrestle that people can often have with the church, even if it is your family legacy, even if it is what you come from, even what you've known your entire life. Sometimes you have those questions, and I love that Grace is so flawed that way, that she is willing to fight that fight. She's willing. I'm Harmony Love from Pop Life Radio, and this question is for Erica. I know it's been said a time or two that writers pull from their personal experiences. So how much of the Greenleaf storyline is your personal experience or taken from your family to bring? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I grew up in the church and I'm a part of a church now, a mega church. And for me, of course, you just open the newspaper now and you see all the headlines of all the things, scandalous stuff that's happening in, in the church. So some of that comes from those headlines, but also, because I've been in the church for a long time, you hear things and you've experienced things and I'll that there that happen in the church, things that have to do with church politics, things that have to do with people getting their feelings hurt in the church, and it sort of just feeds into the uh, dynamic of the family. So some of it is personal experience, most of it isn't, and um, a little bit of, of it all, yeah. You know, one of the things that kept me from being a preacher, really, Frank, <laughs> is that I did not think, I, I, you know, my great, my, my, my great, great grandfather was a, a, a deacon who founded a church in South Carolina, and my great grandmother 
used to always talk about a jack leg. And, and, and who was a jack leg preacher? Who would talk the talk, but who would, on Saturday night, you'd, you'd catch him in the bar and, and you know, sneaking out the back. And I didn't want to be no jack leg. <laughs> and I knew that there were certain things to be upheld that I didn't know if I could 100% uh, of the time uphold that. Now, you know, the, the, another great thing about this, the preacher is just a man. Yeah. And if you don't know that, read the paper. The preacher is just a man with, 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 his, with familial things that happen, uh, 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 with personal uh, uh, trials that they find very difficult to get through, and we get to explore that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the biggest thing about uh, Kevin's storyline is um, you have to have empathy. And um, my first met with Craig and he uh, told me that he wanted me for the role. It was a challenge. It was a challenge, but um, at the same time, it's a real story. And I'm sure if any of you have attended church, you know a Kevin. Um, you've been around a Kevin. Kevin exists right now. And I think the biggest thing we can do as people is just operate from a place of love and understanding. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's a family anywhere that doesn't experience that. Uh, and because of, because of those, you know, like sort of real human things, it's, it, it makes this whole experience quite wonderful. And uh, as, as has been mentioned, when you, when you also have a company of players, with whom it is a pleasure and an honor to be around because they make that easy. I, I don't ever want to get caught acting. And so, and, and the, the, the wonderful thing between Clement and uh, uh, Craig, Eric, and, you know, and these people, I don't have to act. I can just behave. <laughs> well, you know, if you, and if you felt that way, that's the way you're supposed to. You know, so when people wag their finger at me and say, ooh, that's yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that, so there's an affirmation that I'm, that I'm doing my job. It is a courageous storyline. You've never really seen, you know, you've seen shows and stories dance around it, but not meet it head on, you know, in the way, you know, Craig Wright and his team, you know, um, meet it head on. It's a, it's a very weighty, for me, it's a very weighty thing. I didn't realize until recently how weighty this character is uh, for me. Um, I think Meryl Streep mentioned during the Golden Globes, talked about, you know, as actors, we step into the lives of others. This is certainly not a life that anyone would want to step into. And it has taken its toll um, on me. Um, it is, um, and as far as the storyline goes, we just want to tell it in as truthful way as possible. Um, honoring what Kevin feels, whether that be he's 100% gay, whether he's bisexual, whether Wherever this journey takes us, um, we just want to tell it in an authentic way. And uh, luckily, I have a phenomenal scene partner that makes it so easy to work off of. Man, I can make them tears go anytime when I'm working. Anytime. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's just a it's a pleasure and a gift to be able to tell this story because every character that I have played and I hope to play will be a real person and it will touch somebody and maybe be a gift in some way to their life, um, brighten someone's mind, open their mind to a place where they were judgmental at first, and now they understand a little bit more. Uh, and that's the truth of Greenleaf in and of itself, is that uh, yes, we watch for entertainment, but we hope to tell real stories at the same time. Uh, whether it be Greg Allen's character, and <laughs> I'm proud to do it, and I'm proud to do a good job with it. But you know, there's 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 some consequences that come with it. I am very grateful to the audience because I've yet to encounter anyone, you know, who was unable to discern the difference between Greg Allen and the character. You know, folks are, you know, smile, they wag their finger, then they want to take a selfie. Which, <laughs> and, and 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 in some instances, that can bug me. That. We sort of so easily forget that this guy is out there. 
right now. This is not a villain from Mars. This is not an extraterrestrial villain. You know, he walks among us all the time. And I think, and I'm always conscious of that. Uh, and that's where part of the weight comes from. I get, I get, I get to, you know, to, to play that out and to see what the reality of that is. And I find, I think that that is also healing. Because, I mean, I have one, I've read the paper about some of these ministers, and I wonder how they still have congregations. And I've, had, I've asked several of them of it. Everybody has a different opinion about it. But, you know, but, it, but it's very real. So, I mean, and I, I, I absolutely adore the fact that this man has done things in his past to which there are regrets. But when she comes home to break this thing open, is a point in his life when he is willing to face whatever God has to make him answer for. And then there's the vacillation. Okay, give it to me, God, but uh, not like that. <laughs> you know, and, and he has to go through that. And that's, that, that's phenomenal. I, don't, I mean, it's a gift. I don't know, you know, when the last time I've, I've had that to be able to do. I hope that happens. You know, that, that there's, Oprah and I both knew that this show was not there to poke at the black church without honoring it. You know what I'm saying? It's both. It's both all the time. What, one of the reasons I felt so honored to bring this story to life because it demystifies leadership. Mm -hmm. The Bible said, I mean, idol worship is not cool. Mm -hmm. Putting people on a pedestal and not asking a question, well, who are you and who is your mama? Mm -hmm. And where did you come from? Mm -hmm. And what is going on behind your closed doors? Right. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I feel that this story encourages, will encourage people to look past the man mm -hmm. and build a more personal relationship because you never know. I really feel that what we've been able to achieve, even up till this moment, will allow people, if something funny is going on, you know, that is around that pulpit, when preachers start preaching, you know, from a position of beating you with the ruler, using the word of God, you know, it's like, okay, this is a man, let me check in with my maker. And uh, I, I was put on Facebook and I actually talked to my fans and I've had in-depth discussions with my fans about my character and other people's characters and choices that the characters are making. And I hope I can um, express this in the way that I'm, I'm thinking and feeling it. But a lot of times, at least when I grew up in the church, it was fire and brimstone. And you were gonna go to hell if you didn't blah, blah, blah. It was black and white. And what I have found with this show as a, a growing lesson for me, and also just in conversations with fans of the show, that a lot of our real life existence is in the gray area. It's not in the black and white. And so what I think has happened uh, with the show and the writing and and my character in particular staying with a man that was unfaithful and a lot of times people wanted to make that black and white and I had to come in and have discussions with people, you know, to defend my character and, but also to have self-analysis for myself, you know, what's the gray area of this? And it's okay to live in the gray and I think that's what the questions are and the waiting for the, for the deliverance or the, the answers to those questions. So that's something that I hope that people will watch this show and take away from the show and embrace the gray areas of life and being okay residing in those areas in order to ascend to the next plateau. I think one of the things that my mom said is Many months ago, I was told that one of the things that Miss Winfrey wanted to explore and to make clear in the show is that abusers are seducers. And so for me, that's a, a, a driving force 
behind my interpretation of the character and my work. You know, we want to think of these kinds of guys as caped and hooded evil people who snatch children into alleys and cars and abuse them and then sell them to the highest bidder. The truth is that they are seducers. And in order to seduce children, they have to be in regular and constant contact with children. So I felt so honored to be able to humanize leadership without hate or anything, with real compassion, because it's not about the man in the first place. You know, and I think that our show really. Uh, has begun to achieve that, and you know what? God, the second season, who knows what's coming? And if God is good, hallelujah, that's that. <laughs> I just want to say, for me, I, I, you know, the takeaway for me, for the audience, is pay attention. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an uncle, uh, an official of the church, the church council, uh, a, a prominent man in the town. Um, and, and the one we would least suspect. So, and we don't want this sort of evil and misguided motivation to be among us. We don't want that. Who wants that? Nobody wants that. But the truth is that um, abusers are seducers. So that's a powerful, powerful message uh, for me that, that I think the audience can do well to pay attention to. Which is something that happens in all cultures, and you know, we are who we are, but denial and blind eyes to truth. Uh, you know, well, why did Lady May know? Sometimes the way the psyche works, and the work that it takes to get through such a gray and dangerous area, you know? You just enter a state of blind denial. And, and you know, the turn away, or here's something else to do that I think the show will be so great for, Greg, is, you know, no, you did see what you saw. You know, so often we see and we say, oh, we didn't see that, that could be. No, no, you know, so it, it, that, that area of what is going on in your home, what is going on with your children, and how honest are you in your heart and your soul? And, that, and I just wanted to say that the reason I got this tattoo, which I'm excited you asked me about, <laughs> I just wanted to say this. Until the rule of law and the standards of common decency are restored in this country, no rest. Until the rule of law and the standards of common decency are restored in this country, no silence. And until the rule of law and the standards of common decency are restored in this country, no peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all. And on that